I want to welcome everybody and um, just tell you that this is the March 2024 textual study on the Bible and Beyond discussions. I am your host, Shirley Paulson, and our guest scholar this evening, Adeline Harrington, actually almost Dr. Harrington. So you're just about ready to defend your dissertation, aren't you? That's right. Very soon in a couple of weeks. Okay. Well, we offer our congratulations to you. And I'm really excited to talk to you about uh, your project. So our topic tonight is new discoveries in the Oxyrhynchus trash heap. <laughs> so there are several strange words in the title of our event this evening, like discoveries from a trash heap and Oxyrhynchus. But I will say some fun things are coming out of this trash heap that we're going to talk about. The main point is that Oxyrhynchus is a city in Egypt that has a trash heap from 2,000 years ago. So I'm eager to get into this conversation. I think most of our Bible and Beyond participants are aware of Nag Hammadi texts. Maybe not everybody, but we'll get into that. We've discussed some of the texts, such as the secret revelation of John, the perfect thunder, and the thought of Norea. Most of us know that Nag Hammadi is in Egypt, and this location became the name of this remarkable collection of ancient writings pertaining to Jesus. But you have some fascinating things to tell us about another Egyptian city where a lot of other writings have been found. This is Oxyrhynchus. I'm wondering if you could help us um, get situated by telling us where Oxyrhynchus is and how it relates to Nag Hammadi just geographically. Let's get started there. Yeah, thank you. So, um, Nag Hammadi is in the south of Egypt. Um, Oxyrhynchus is a mid-sized city that's located right smack dab in the middle of Egypt, so in an area called Middle Egypt. Um, it sits on a small offshoot of the Nile, so not the Nile itself, but a small little river jutting out from the Nile called the Bar Yusuf Canal, which is actually um, named after Joseph from the New Testament, since the Holy <laughs> Family was said to have traveled through the area when they were in Egypt, according to the Gospel of Matthew. Um, Nag Hammadi is also located on the Nile, but it's about 260 miles south of Oxyrhynchus. Um, so Oxyrhynchus is about the midpoint between the Nile, um, on the Nile between Cairo and Nag Hammadi. Today, it would be about a five hour car ride. Um, and in antiquity, in the Roman period, where most of the fragments from Oxyrhynchus come, the journey would have taken about five to seven days by boat. Great. Okay. Well, that helps us get a feel for what you're talking about. I have to say the first time I read the word Oxyrhynchus, I goes, what is that word? <laughs> so I'm getting used to it, though. This is an exciting place. So can you describe when the first discoveries were made at Oxyrhynchus and maybe you like what they found and what period of time you think the manuscripts might have been written from these first discoveries? Yeah, absolutely. So um, they were first discovered at the turn of the 20th century. Um, in 1896, there were two graduate students named uh, Arthur Grenfeld and Bernard Hunt, uh, Bernard Grenfeld and Arthur Hunt, excuse me. Um, they started digging in Oxyrhynchus, um, or the area that's today known as Albanasa. And they just started digging there because they were given a tip by locals that they might be able to find some early Christian manuscripts there. And within the first couple of days of digging, they were proved absolutely correct. They ended up finding in the first couple of days, one of the earliest fragments we've still ever found from the Gospel of Matthew. And the first ever copy of what we'd come to know later as the Gospel of Thomas, um, which we've found three copies now of the Gospel of Thomas at Oxyrhynchus. But when they first found it, um, there was no title and it just uh, appeared to be a list of sayings of Jesus. So in the early publications, they called it the words of Jesus or the Logia of the Lord. Um, and it wasn't until they discovered Nag Hammadi years later that they knew the title of the work and were able to recognize that there were three copies of the Gospel of Thomas in this city found um, even a couple of centuries earlier. Since these like earlier excavations as well, it's estimated that they found about half a million, so 500,000 fragments throughout these excavations. Um, and since then, we've only published just less than 6,000. So 
we've published between one to 2% of the actual fragments that have been recovered from Oxyrhynchus. Um, they seem to date somewhere between 200 BCE um, to around the seventh century CE or AD. Um, but a large majority of the published material and especially the literary fragments are dated between the first century and the fifth century. So during the Roman period and an early Byzantine period. Wow, there's so many questions we will want to ask you about that, but I also want to get into the meat of what you have found yourself. So I, uh, we're going to try to narrow our conversation a little bit, but there's so many wonderful questions to ask you. Maybe you can ask, answer, like, why would people have gotten more interested than in Nagamati if this is so rich and full and has it even been fully explored yet? What, what's going on with Nagamati being even better known? Yeah, so um, Nag Hammadi was especially interesting because what we have in Nag Hammadi are several intact, fully bound codices or ancient books um, that are fairly well preserved. Um, their fine context is a little dubious. There's a lot of stories that have been told about how they've been found. Um, but what we have are a lot of Coptic um, copies of early Christian texts that likely date between the mid fourth century or maybe even the mid fifth century. Um, there's been some carbon dating done on them um, and they seem to date within that hundred year range about that time. Um, what we have at Oxyrhynchus on the other hand are earlier uh, mm -hmm. Christian texts. So many dated to the second century, the third century and the fourth century and they're copied in Greek. So they are earlier versions of some of these texts that we'll later find in Nag Hammadi. What made Nag Hammadi a little bit more enticing, um, especially to scholars of early Christianity, was how intact these texts from Nag Hammadi were. So in Oxyrhynchus, we often get fragments that are um, less than the size of an iPhone, right? So <laughs> they're very, very small fragments. We do not have usually multiple pages of these texts. Um, and at Nakamadi, we have the exact opposite. So we have full codices and we can see which texts are being read together. And it makes for a lot of really interesting study. Um, part of why, if you're not familiar with Nakamadi, people are interested in Nakamadi is not that they are just copies of early Christian texts, but they're copies of early Christian texts that we hear about from um, early church authors that talk about heretics and Gnostics, um, sort of the bad Christians, or maybe even people they didn't consider Christians at all, um, who were reading texts that had to do with Jesus or some kind of tradition um, and claiming that they were Christian groups, right? Um, we only hear about them from their opponents who are writing about them to discredit them in the second, third and fourth centuries. And so what made Nag Hammadi so fascinating is that for the very first time, we have some texts that resemble the um, mythic systems, the narratives that we hear about from their opponents. But we now have sort of firsthand textual knowledge of what they were actually reading and we're able to compare them with them. Wow. Um, at, at Oxyrhynchus, we have some of the texts from Nag Hammadi, but we also have uh, a different variety. It's not the exact same texts. Oh my gosh, that's so fascinating. So I, mean, I have to ask you, back to Oxyrhynchus again, why would a garbage heap be so interesting? I mean, a garbage heap sounds like garbage. Is that right? It really is garbage? Yeah, absolutely. So um, this these 500,000 fragments that they've recovered, they're not all early Christian texts, right? So these are ancient garbage dumps, which means that they found food waste and old sandals and um, pieces of trash. Uh, in addition to early Christian texts, we also have um, literary works like classical uh, poetry, the works of Sappho and Homer and Euripides. But in addition to that, we have tons of receipts and marriage contracts and business dealings and lists and a lot of sort of everyday things that you would throw out in your own trash. Um, and so the Oxyrhynchus early Christian fragments are mixed up in this dump. And every year that new Oxyrhynchus papyri are published, it's Christian fragments, documentary texts, which are those sort of like receipts and lists and things that we don't consider literature, um, as well as a bunch of other types of finds. Wow. 
My goodness. So this, it must have taken some real creativity to figure out that there was something worth looking at besides all the receipts and sandals and food garbage and all that kind of stuff. It's fascinating. Okay. Yeah. So the reason I got so interested in having you come to talk to us is that when you spoke at the Society of Biblical Literature in November, you suggested that with a closer look at the context of the fragments in Oxford, because you felt it had a lot more to say about our interpretation of the things that sound Gnostic. So I, I'm just really wondering if you could talk about what were you looking at that brought this up for you? Yeah, so part of what my work does is I have looked at the Oxyrhynchus fragments and I have isolated um, I, or I've identified the Christian fragments from the trash heap, right? And so I've identified 245 early Christian literary and sort of paraliterary texts, which means it may not have been a whole book, but maybe a single sheet or an abridged version of something or a quotation. Um, 245 of them. I cataloged them and I traced them over um, from the second century all the way down to the seventh century. And I tried to trace trends in mm -hmm. who is reading these texts and when they are reading these texts and how those trends change over time. So what were the earliest Christians in Oxyrhynchus reading in the second century? And what were the latest Christians in Oxyrhynchus reading in the fifth, sixth and seventh centuries, right? And what I found is that many of the texts from Nag Hammadi that we find at Oxyrhynchus, and there are four main texts that we find at Oxyrhynchus, as well as a number of other texts that have similar terminology or similar themes. But the texts from Oxyrhynchus that we find are um, the three copies of the Gospel of Thomas, two copies, maybe three now, from the Gospel of Mary, um, we also have a copy of another text that's very rarely talked about, the Sophia of Jesus Christ, which is found both at Oxyrhynchus and also in the Berlin Codex, where we find the Gospel of Mary, and uh, also the first Apocalypse of James, which is another um, the New Testament, or not New Testament, but Christian Apocalypse, uh, in which James is the receiver of a revelation. Um, and Though these texts have been cited by scholars um, as coming from Oxyrhynchus, in addition to Nag Hammadi, they're rarely ever studied in the context of the city itself. And so part of what I do is I look at these so-called Gnostic texts or heretical texts, along with all of that other trash that we get from the trash heap. So part of what I do is a garbological study. So <laughs> I... What that means is that I am specifically analyzing these texts, not as pieces of um, all of them as pieces of literature, but as something that people threw away with the rest of their life. Right. Um, so I'm able to compare what people are, what Christians in Oxyrhynchus are reading, along with the things that they're throwing away, um, along with the people that we have in the city at that time. Um, and what we get from that is a sense of who is reading these texts, how much these texts might have cost, um, in addition to some of the changing culture of Oxyrhynchus that's happening over time. And one of the common aspects that I've found with the Oxyrhynchus Gnostic texts is that they often don't focus as much on those um, very complicated sort of mythic theological systems that we're often really used to when we think about Gnosticism, right? That they sound strange, they use a lot of strange words, they bring in a lot of strange names, um, and they have these really long protologies or these creations before the creation of the world. Um, the Oxyrhynchus texts allude to some of these terms and concepts, but they often focus on sayings of Jesus. And this seems to be a really, really popular type of text in Oxyrhynchus that isn't just um, Gnostic texts, right? Um, when we talk about Gnosticism, we have to remember that this word is not something that's used by the texts in Nag Hammadi. Um, it's not something that the Christians in the second or third century likely often called themselves, if at all. And so we have to think about these texts, not as Gnostic texts necessarily, but as just 
a few of many of the Christian texts that we found in Oxyrhynchus. In addition to the so-called Gnostic texts from Oxyrhynchus, we have found the majority of our New Testament papyri. So out of the hundreds of New Testament papyri that we found from Egypt, 46% of all of our papyri that we've ever found of the New Testament have come from this one city, Oxyrhynchus. So we shouldn't just think of Oxyrhynchus as a city that had Gnostics or heretics in it. We should think of it as a city from which most of our Christian evidence is coming from. And by doing that, we're able to see what was being read alongside these so-called Gnostic texts. And that includes especially um, the very fa- the very uh, favorite gospel in Oxyrhynchus was the Gospel of John, by far. Um, especially in the second and third centuries, the Gospel of John um, was copied more than any other text, um, any other Christian text. Um, Coming in second is the Gospel of Matthew, which is also another early favorite in the second and third centuries, but it's the Gospel of Matthew that continues to be a favorite in the fourth, fifth, and sixth centuries. Um, So we can see some intertexts happening there. In addition to early Christian uh, New Testament texts, one of the things that seems to hold together some of the so-called Gnostic texts that we find from Oxyrhynchus is a cast of recurring characters. Um, And most often, the only thing that the so-called Gnostic texts have in common is that they feature someone named Mary in their texts. A woman named Mary is often an interlocutor of Jesus, which means she's asking Jesus questions and Jesus is answering her. Um, In the first Apocalypse of James, she doesn't have a speaking role, but she, alongside three other women, Salome, Martha, and Arsinoe, are named as disciples. Um, And in the text, it's implied that they are perhaps more trustworthy than some of the other disciples of Jesus that we get in some of our other New Testament Gospels. Um, So what ties them together, if they are being read together at all, Um, might be a different motivation than what we find in the non-commodity text, which not all of them include Mary Magdalene or any type of Mary, um, but they do have some similar uh, terminological streams. They do have some similar interests. Uh, They're very interested in um, sort of a divine that includes either a female aspect or maybe an androgynous aspect. There's a lot of varied interests in these texts, Um, But that's all to say that the earliest years in Oxyrhynchus, the second and third centuries, were incredibly diverse. It does not seem that these texts represented heretical strains, but they really represented lots of different kinds of conversations that were happening in Egypt during the second and third centuries. You, I think you have made us really excited to jump into Oxyrhynchus right with you. (laughs) This is really thrilling, very fun to hear about all this, just some extra questions that you you raised uh, that I, that I wanted to just go over with you. You had mentioned back at um and when you were talking in um um at SBL about the interest in the um the cost of the production and what that had to do with why we're reading what we're reading. Could you talk a little bit about that too, and then we'll go into some other questions. But I just want to catch up on that one too. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, one of the, one of the aspects of my dissertation that took the longest was that I was not only charting 245 different Christian manuscripts over several centuries, um, but I was really determined to, uh, use a scholar named Roger Bagnall, who came up with a way to calculate the cost of ancient books, um, using some ancient price edicts along with some documentary papyri, we're able to figure out sort of the cost of goods and services in antiquity. So the cost of papyri, the cost of scribal labor, um, and this varied depending on how big you wanted your book, how long your text was that you were copying. Um, what kind of script did you want your scribe to use? A really fancy script or a really simple script? And all of these features affected how much a single copy of a book was, right? Mm-hmm. So. In antiquity, we have to remember that um, we do not have the antecedent to our modern day Bible. We do not have a book that's full of the 27 books of the New Testament that we often find in New Testament canons today. Um, They're not together with an Old Testament. We often have 
Christian texts and any text in antiquity being copied individually. So if you're going to copy the Gospel of Thomas, that's the only text you're going to copy, right? You don't necessarily have a copy of the Gospel of Thomas with six other Gospels and a bunch of letters of Paul. Um, so we have individual books that are being copied. Part of what I did in my study is I tried to calculate the cost of every single Christian fragment from Oxyrhynchus. And that means that I had to find the dimension of these fragments. Um, I had to uh, grade their script based on if they were calligraphic or a more documentary script. And a lot of that work is a little bit subjective, but I did my best to find a relative scale. So we were able to look at Oxyrhynchus manuscripts in relation to one another. And by doing that, we were able to see, okay, what are the most expensive texts that were ever copied in Oxyrhynchus? And what are the least expensive texts? And by doing that, you're able to see, okay, who would have really been able to afford even a single copy of these texts? Not just, not a whole New Testament book, which would have been significantly expensive, um, but a single copy of these texts. And often what we find is that even a single copy of a text like the Gospel of Mark, which is one of our shortest gospels, um, is going to be completely inaccessible for anybody below um, an elite level of income or the highest middle class level of income, right? So my dissertation gets very technical into a lot of these numbers, um, but that's just to say that it excludes the majority of the ancient population. Um, about 90% of the population, even if they were able to read or access any of these texts, they would not have been able to afford them out of their own pocket, which means that the ancient texts that we have, even the so-called heretical or Gnostic ones, were definitely being funded by people with extreme wealth in Oxyrhynchus. So some of the most important and central people in Oxyrhynchus society. Um, part of what I argue is that they are being funded, promoted um, by church officials themselves. So not necessarily a secluded secret group of heretics hiding in the shadows, but very much promoted um, by some of the most central church authorities. Okay, and there's so many more questions. Again, I want to ask you about all these things, but I want to go back to your your point too about the the role of the so-called Gnostic, we don't even use that word in here, Bible and beyond, um, but um, these texts that were now considered so heretical and different. And, and you, I like the way you talk about reading them side by side with these other things. You also mentioned that there were um, the, an interest in the magical practices and magical papyri, as you study those too. How does the magical stuff fit alongside of these kinds of texts? Were they sort of like separate categories or were they all mixed together? Or how do you read that too? Yeah, so um, alongside all of these other sort of documentary papyri and literary papyri, there's some texts that are sort of in between. There's a lot of texts that cite New Testament texts like um, the four canonical gospels or a letter of Paul, for instance, um, but they were used in some sort of magical ritual. Um, so they're often, uh, if they're a Christian magical text, they are almost always being used for healing of some sort. So um, praying over the sick, um, praying uh, to prevent a scorpion sting. Um, there's a very gray line between what is a prayer versus what is a magical ritual. Um, but in any case, it seems that the magical texts in Oxyrhynchus are among the cheapest of any of the early Christian texts you can have. And that's often because they are circulating on one page, right? So a one page text, which is doesn't require any binding, doesn't require um, any uh, specialized labor besides the papyrus itself and the, um, the scribal labor doesn't require any other sort of production labor. So anything that's going to be copied on a single sheet is um, incredibly inexpensive uh, compared to some of our um, bound codex codexes, right, our codices. And what this means is that um, when we're thinking about accessibility, um, if you're thinking about a middle-class Christian ever owning a Christian text, one of the only texts that they may have been able to purchase themselves was a magical text. And what's really interesting is that in Oxyrhynchus, um, these magical texts begin to be produced around the fourth century, and they really uh, 
explode from there. So in the fourth, fifth, and sixth centuries, we have lots of Christian magical texts, specifically healing amulets. And it often seems that the the names that are cited in these magical amulets are martyrs that are often um, found at healing shrines in Oxyrhynchus. Um, and based on who would have been able to produce these texts, um, have knowledge of a lot of the texts that they're citing, um, and have the literacy to be able to produce them, it seems that they were likely being produced um, and promoted by church officials in the city. So priests um, and monks who are at these martyr shrines and at churches, because martyr shrines, churches, and monasteries were healing centers in the 4th, 5th, and 6th centuries. Um, the Christians in Oxyrhynchus, just like in the rest of the ancient Mediterranean, um, were often healing centers for the ancient world. Um, and they're the antecedent to our modern day hospital. The abundance of healing amulets that we find in Oxyrhynchus um, is a testament to the fact that magical practices were very much part of healing in antiquity. So in order to heal as a Christian, um, making Christian amulets is part of that process. Okay, now that's you bring up another whole huge subject here with the the healing centers and the amulets and so forth. So we've moved along. It seems like we moved a lot farther from the earlier, like first and second century works on healing. So what what can you t describe a little bit? What do you mean by magic? That's probably a term we just don't, don't use in modern everyday world. Uh, what that means? I mean, we go to magic shows. I expect to have somebody trick us but it's not the same thing you're talking about with healing. So give us a little clue about what you mean by magical papyri. Correct. So um, in this is a very uh, fraught subject in ancient Mediterranean studies and papyrology because it's really hard to define what magic is. Um, and part of that is that um, magic is bound up in uh, ancient activity and ancient ritual generally, right? So um, like I said, there's very little that distinguishes a prayer that's written down from a magical amulet. And what I mean by a magical amulet is in antiquity, um, if you wanted a good luck charm, if you wanted um, protection, or if you wanted healing, often what um, you would do is you would go to a ritual specialist, and this could be a priest, for instance, at a temple in the first or second century. Um, you could also go to a magical practitioner or a magician who was not necessarily working within a temple, but often working within a temple. Um, in the fourth, fifth, and sixth centuries, you would go to a church or a monastery or a martyr shrine to get these magical texts. And what they would do is they would write down your name write down um, often an excerpt from a text. So either a Christian text or um, maybe a um, an earlier prayer, um, an earlier hymn, something like that. And they would often invoke a set of names. Um, in the first and second century, this could vary widely um, on, in terms of the names that they called upon. Once we get into the Christian period, we often find that they're calling upon God, Jesus, often the Virgin Mary, but also often um, several martyrs. And sometimes these are famous martyrs who are disciples. And often we find that they are local martyrs. So martyrs that are locally celebrated in Oxyrhynchus or in other parts of Egypt. Um, they were seen as sort of um, patron saints of that area. And they had special power protecting the people of Oxyrhynchus and the people of um, Middle Egypt and Egypt generally. Um, so we have well-known martyrs like Thecla, for instance. We also have some little known martyrs um, like uh, Serenus and Philoxenus was one of the most famous in Oxyrhynchus. A lot of our magical texts are to Philoxenus. And uh, amulets to him are likely being produced at his martyr shrine. When you invoke these saints um, or these earlier divine names, um, you can then have, have a little magical ritual or a prayer set over the um, person in question. And that person may sometimes wear that amulet. So that they might fold it up and wear it around their neck. They might put it in their pocket or a little satchel. They might put it under their pillow. They might put it, um, they might bury it in 
uh, the threshold of their doorway or above their doorway as a protective measure. Um, and this is just something that was very common in the ancient world that we find in earlier periods of Oxyrhynchism that just continues into the Christian period. Okay, now I, I promised our guests here today that um, every time we meet together that they get the second half of, the, of an hour together. So I will turn over the microphone to everybody else if you have questions or thoughts, something you want to ask um, our, our scholar here today. You could uh, raise your hand. It's better if you do it electronically so I can see who's in order. Otherwise, if you don't know how to do that, just put your hand hand up and then we'll, we'll get going with this. So uh, there's so many things I would like to ask, but let's let's see what, what other people want to talk about. Sarah Barnacle, you're first. Go ahead and tell us what you want to talk about. You're, you unmute yourself. I was wondering, listening to all that wonderful information, if there's been any way to tell how these Christians, um, religious people in Oxyrhynchus, related to the the civil government in that area. Were they protected in that practice? Were they opposed? You yeah. know, so thinking about the Gospels that we have in the canon and, and yeah. how there was opposition there. Yeah, that's a great question. So Oxyrhynchus is actually one of the very few cities that we have papyrological evidence for persecution of Christians, right? So we have evidence that Christians in Oxyrhynchus um, had their property confiscated, um, and were required to sacrifice to the imperial cult, um, make sacrifices and uh, and record their sacrifices to prove that um, they are doing their due diligence. Um, once we hit the fourth century, uh, Oxyrhynchus becomes very much a, a city in which Christianity is very much the mainstream tradition. And it seems that most of the civic officials be to, be, uh, begin taking on Christian names as well. So they're likely beginning to become the majority in Oxyrhynchus very, very early. Um, but we do know that they were uh, experiencing a great deal of oppression in the second and third centuries. We get this evidence. Uh, it's mostly coming in the late third century. Yeah. Which makes you think that and, uh, it wasn't just Christians throwing away their papers. Oh, could absolutely. Have been, they could have been hiding them. They could have been part of a punishment or a pogrom or something. Um, not yeah. necessarily so just we, people say, I don't want this anymore. Yeah. So <laughs> there's a fantastic article if you're inter if you're more interested in um, the Oxyrhynchus papyri, looking at them as trash. Anne-Marie Lyondike has a, an article. I think it's called um, Sacred Trash. Um, and it's all about sort of questioning if these are trash, like were they thrown away because people didn't want them or not? And she asks a, a litany of other questions, but um, you're absolutely correct that it's not just Christian trash that we have from Oxyrhynchus. We also have trash of all of these other civic officials, people that really would have opposed Christianity as well in the city. Um, so there's a lot of different voices. There is definitely not a uniform set of beliefs and practices in the city at any point. Thank you. Okay, until we have other questions, I'm going to keep on asking my own questions because I want to ask some things too here. <clears throat> um, you said that you um, worked hard to organize these things chronologically. Um, first of all, why did you do that and what did you find? I see that we have three other questions, so you can answer that briefly before we go to the other questions. Yeah, so um, dating ancient papyri is very, very difficult. Um even though scholars often talk about, oh, this is a third century text, what they mean when they say that is that often they are dating the text based on the handwriting used or the script that is used. And it's sort of like fonts today. Um, you can tell like Times New Roman is really popular for us today, um, but other fonts were much more popular at the turn of the 20th century. Um, and certain fonts have um, periods of being very popular. So when people are dating these texts, they're often doing so by saying this handwriting looks like it's from the third century. And so part of what I had to do for my study is I had to redate all of the papyri from Oxyrhynchus because everybody was sort of making subjective guesses for the last hundred years as to when these papyri may have been written. Um, and it was made by different scholars, hundreds of different scholars. Um, so I tried to standardize that a little bit and uh, provide 
more standardized dates for these texts. And by doing that, I can trend, I can trace those trends um, from the earlier periods to the later periods of the city. My goodness sakes, what work you put into this. Okay, so Andre, you're next. What's your thought or your question? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. What I hear you say is that a lot of the scraps that you're picking up at Oxyrhynchus that have yeah. to do with Christianity sounds mostly like incantations. Many of them, yes. So definitely not all of them. But once we hit the 4th, 5th, and 6th century, um, magical texts become some of the more popular texts. But they're also alongside other ritual and sort of liturgical texts um, or hymns or sort of notes and commentaries. There's a series of other texts that would have been used in Christian rituals, and they explode kind of around the same time that these magical texts explode. And what that means uh, partially is that churches have an influx of money starting in the fourth century. They're able to produce a lot more types of texts. They're not just spending their money on Christian books or Christian literature proper, as we might know it, but on all these other supplementary kinds of texts, like magical texts, but also notes and commentaries and things like that. Well, what I really am, am hoping to find out is, um, do the scraps that you've been able to identify and read, is there anything in there that indicates in its content, uh, what shall I say, a, a, a growing understanding or a continuing understanding of what the founder of Christianity said, who started all this? I mean, do, does it mention Jesus' teachings or Peter's or Absolutely. anybody's? Yes. So uh, Jesus' name is invoked most often on Christian texts, right? Um, and often sayings of Jesus are um, some of the most valuable texts for magical rituals because they're considered so powerful. And so these are tech, these are quotes from um, the Gospel of Matthew often. There's a lot of quotes from the Gospel of Matthew. There's a lot of quotes from Psalms. There's a lot of quotes from the Gospel of John. Um, there's one from the Gospel of Mark. Uh, there's a whole host of sort of canonical Christian texts that are also being used within there. Um, however, there's not ever a standard view of sort of what the founders intended, right? There's no, there's no pure um, original first century idea of Christianity that everybody has in their heads at any point in the city, right? Everybody always has a really varied approach to it because our, their sources, just like ours, are extremely varied and they don't always agree with one another. Thank you for that very interesting question too, Honor. Susan, you're next. Would you unmute and tell us what you're thinking? Um, okay, I don't know what this is, how the connection works here, but what keeps coming to mind is, uh, are you familiar with retablos? I'm not. Okay, um, Shirley, can you can you say what they are? Are you familiar with them? I don't know what you're talking about either. I'm sorry to say. Okay, it's a. Um, it's a, it's a it's a devotional uh painting uh that's um uh, it's like a religious picture uh, mm -hmm. portraying usually uh a healing uh a common thing especially in the area of like the Mex Mexican US border um the, a common thing you would do when you would had some kind of spiritual healing is you would go to the county fair and hook up with the artist there and they would do a painting of your healing for you to have a record wow. uh, which uh you know oh my gosh i took a a, a one you know a two hour workshop and oh my gosh it, it was just and got to see a bunch of them it was just so fascinating uh and these would be probably primarily uh often catholics that would would practice this this way. Um, and I just thought it was so beautiful. And for some reason, hearing you talk about all this other stuff, it makes me think 
because it, and even the fact that you don't even know about it and it's a hugely common practice along the southern all the southern border especially area and um uh and and that's you know instead of like writing it in a journal or writing an article or something you you have an artist do a painting for you yeah to, absolutely um anyway um so does that what would I don't I don't that's what kept coming to mind I'm like well I'm just gonna throw it out yeah. there it is very similar in that these magical texts they are they're they don't represent every magical ritual that happened to Noxyrhynchus they are simply um a few examples of like a material record of these kinds of practices that would have been taken right. place all the time so, so the type of magical texts that we actually have are sort of like souvenirs, right? They are supplemental. They are not the primary um, goal of a ritual, right? You can have magical incantations and magical rituals without any type of magical text. So there would have been thousands and thousands of magical rituals or prayers happening in Oxyrhynchus all the time. Um, and so many of these magical texts are very much souvenirs of this ritual that's taking place. Yeah, so there is some parallel there. Okay. Thank you so much for the uh, for drawing the pictures for us, Susan. I appreciate that. Uh, and so, dear DJA, <laughs> Diana, go ahead and unmute yourself and tell us what you're thinking. I was just wondering, are these uh, going to be published or are, have they been basically translated or or do you still need to translate them or? Yes. So um, there, uh, all of the published fragments, uh, all the fragments in my study are published. Um, and they are almost all published within the Oxyrhynchus papyri volumes. Um, so many of these are open access already because they were published so long ago. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the most recent volumes are not open access. They they do cost a significant amount of money, but you can find translations for a lot of um, the most um, the most interesting ones, according to early Christian scholars and classicists. Uh, that you can often find them on blogs online. Um, but they are published and translated within the Oxyrhynchus papyri volumes. Yeah. With this um, this concept of uh, these magical chants or whatever, are they sort of like a continuation of the ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead type of thing? Yeah, but they are not just happening in Egypt. We know that they these practices are happening all across the ancient Mediterranean. So they would have been happening okay. in Rome. They would have been happening in Athens, Constantinople. Um, and this material is only surviving in Egypt because Egypt is... Um, hot and dry all the time, which means it preserves organic materials really well um, versus somewhere like Rome or Greece or Constantinople where the temperature fluctuates and the humidity fluctuates. And that means organic material decays really fast. So even though we have a lot of the strange material like magical texts and Gnostic texts from Egypt, it doesn't mean that only um, Egyptians were interested in these kinds of texts. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And so, Arnold, you can unmute yourself and talk to us. Earlier, you said, I believe, that the fragments you've discovered, uh, in the fragments you've discovered, there are more quotes from the Gospels of Matthew and from John than there are from Mark. Could yes. you say more about why this may have been this way? Yeah, it's really, really interesting. We have so few copies of the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Luke from Oxyrhynchus. Um, we really don't have many copies of either of these texts um, in the city. And that's partially because the canon that we're so familiar with today really did not become popularized until the late fourth century. Um, and even then, it wasn't necessarily used everywhere, even in the late fourth century. Um, it's not until the Council of Trent, which I believe was in the 15th or 16th century, that we finally get um, a sort of Catholic Church deciding, you are not allowed to read these books, you must read these other books. So there really were a wealth of other texts that people were interested in um, prior to the fourth century and even after the fourth century. 
All that's to say, um, when we think about the expensive cost to produce books, often, what, especially in the second and third centuries, when Christianity was still, uh, and churches were still relying on the um, generosity of wealthy donors, for the most part, you kind of have to prioritize your resources on texts that you really value. And so the texts that we have the most copies of these are, this is evidence of texts that people valued in Oxyrhynchus. And so they seem to have really valued the Gospel of John and they seem to have really valued the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew is really popular, we know, throughout the ancient Mediterranean. It's one of the most quoted Gospels by any of our earliest patristic sources. Um, so people loved it. It includes, it was probably one of the first to include a birth story of Jesus, right? We don't have a birth story in the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark is also very short. Um, we also have a series of other Gospels in Oxyrhynchus that don't align close. I mean, they do align in somewhat, but they don't align verbatim with our four canonical Gospels. And we don't really know what texts they came from. They're sayings of Jesus, they're episodes of Jesus. And a lot of them seem to sort of be combinations of gospel narratives or like synoptic views of these narratives, which we also knew were popular, especially in the third century, texts like the Dia Tesseron, um, Bitation, which sort of takes a harmonized account of all four of the gospels. So these were really popular. And you can see how they might be uh, especially appealing if you can only afford, uh, if you're a rural church, for instance, and you can only afford one gospel um, to purchase this year, right? Which one are you going to spend your money on? Um, the earliest favorite was the Gospel of John, though. And these seem to coincide a lot with um, some of our so-called Gnostic texts and their ideas as well, but also just ancient education in general. They were very interested in um, philosophical uh, dialogues. They were very interested in um, sort of platonic concepts of uh, God as the divine, the one, right? To how to understand the creation of the universe, how to understand the logos, which we hear about in the Gospel of John, but we also hear about from a litany of other philosophical texts. Um, the Gospel of John might have been uh, closer to if you were sort of an elite person in the ancient world and you were educated in um, sort of the Greek style of education, you were you would have been familiar with a lot of terminology and concepts in these texts. And the Gospel of John may have been appealing. This may have tell this may tell us something about the education of some of our earliest Christian readers. Uh, many of them were likely being educated in Alexandria, right? The it was much closer than other parts of the ancient Mediterranean had to Alexandria. It that had a lot of proximity down the Nile. We do know that there was a lot of communication between Oxyrhynchus and Alexandria. People were traveling to and from there a lot. And it had a very specific sort of intellectual culture um, and series of texts that people enjoyed. These included a bunch of philosophers and also people like Philo, a Jewish philosopher that sort of blended um, Jewish biblical texts and Greek philosophy. So um, that I think is one of the reasons that the Gospel of John is very popular in Oxyrhynchus, uh, though it does begin to wane in popularity starting in the fourth century. And part of what I argue is that the popularity of the Gospel of John may be declining because of its frequent misuse um, in the church uh, by, uh, heresiologists talk about groups like Gnostic groups misusing the Gospel of John for um, different interpretations that could be understood, uh, misunderstood by other Christians, right? Um, so the Gospel of Matthew may have been uh, a, a, a more streamlined version for uh, what the later churches were trying to accomplish. Yeah. So that's a very simplistic answer for a very complicated uh idea of text reception in antiquity, but those are some of the ideas that we might begin thinking about. Okay, this is fascinating. Okay, and Toto, your thoughts or question when you and you. Hi, yeah. Um, I was curious about what was the Egyptian um, religion in the area, aside from, I mean, obviously when Rome came in, um, <clears throat> And there was Greek and Roman influence. 
But what was, is there any texts there that talk about the Egyptian religions? Yeah, absolutely. And it's fascinating, the just the amount of stuff that we have in Oxyrhynchus. Oxyrhynchus, like the rest of Egypt, was Hellenized, which means that it was um, invaded by Alexander the Great in um, the 4th century BCE. Mm -hmm. And after that point, Greek became the language, the lingua franca that um, people mostly spoke if they were doing any type of economic dealings in antiquity, but any also any official business. And if you were going to be educated to learn how to read and write, you were going to be educated in Greek. And you began to adopt um, a Greek manner of city planning and a Greek manner of um, rituals and traditions. So what we have uh, in Oxyrhynchus prior to the onset of Christianity in the region is a blended version of sort of Greek practices, Roman practices, and sort of Egyptian traditions. Um, and these included very famous Egyptian gods like Isis and Serapis um, and Osiris, um, Egyptian gods like that. But the patron deity of Oxyrhynchus was actually this um, hippopotamus goddess named Thoeris. Um, and she was often later associated with Isis herself. So she was sort of conflated with Isis, um, sometimes with sort of an Artemis Aphrodite kind of character. And it's very interesting that in later years of Oxyrhynchus, we get a lot of female patron saints. This includes the Virgin Mary, this includes Thecla, this includes um, a saint named Euphemia, another saint named Christina. So the Virgin Mary becomes the most celebrated saint in Oxyrhynchus after a certain period. And, and you do have to wonder, is this sort of a continuation of um, a sort of ritual tradition that was really revolving around uh, female deities and also female priestesses, right? And from there, we might branch off and think about some of those so-called Gnostic texts and the uh, women within those texts and how they would have been received in different ways within a city like Oxyrhynchus, in which not only divine versions of the feminine were very common uh, in the area, but also female priestesses and uh, women involved in ceremonies, right? If women were not allowed to hold clergy or leadership positions in the church, one of the ways that they could operate within the church are in ceremonial positions, um, and this is likely the case for many of our early Christian readers as well. Well, another great question. So we're um, running near the end of our time here, and I want to just throw in a quick question for myself before we come back to honor. Um, you had mentioned earlier that there was a, a, an unusual emphasis on women in mm -hmm. these texts. And so it seems interesting that if you're talking about the um, patronage being an element of you know these important things coming about because of the patronage, how is it that women became so prominent in these discussions then? Yeah, so one of my main arguments um, within one of my chapters of my dissertation uh, is talking about, okay, who are some of our early Christian benefactors, right? Um, and often what we many of our sources that we get um, from the second and third century when they're talking about some early Christian groups, especially groups that really valued uh, the Marys or, or the female witnesses to the resurrection, right? Easter is coming up soon. When we think about the resurrection episode, that empty tomb, um, the women at the empty tomb seem to be like a main focus of some of our Oxyrhynchus texts. And these women are often conflated. Sometimes it's Mary Magdalene, sometimes it's uh, Salome, sometimes it's Martha, sometimes it's a host of other people named Mary or other women or wives or mothers. Um, but in Oxyrhynchus, Mary and Salome are frequently appearing in Oxyrhynchus texts. Um, and they seem to be often portrayed as interlocutors of Jesus. They're not mentioned alongside a husband or um, often uh, associated with sons or other family members, which in the ancient world, when you are when you name someone, you often say, you know, Adeline, daughter of Charlie, right? These women are not being named as such, and it's likely because they are um, more independent, uh, wealthy women. And even our canonical New Testament gospels 
tell us that these women were ministering to Jesus or supporting him in his ministry. Um, and it could be that these women are being upheld by early Christians in Oxyrhynchus as sort of patronesses of Jesus. And they may have even served as models for female patronesses in Oxyrhynchus who are going to donate to the church, right? So when you're thinking about uh, texts serving as role models for early Christians, these women who were disciples in the inner circle of Jesus and providing for his ministry uh, may have been exactly what early church officials wanted some of their um, early Christian women in the church to be reading, right? Um, they, we do know that there were a lot of wealthy women in the second and third century that we hear about from the heresiologists that specifically were reading texts, uh, including Mary Magdalene and Salome. Um, so there's a lot of really interesting overlap all over the place. And a lot of it is very tangential, right? We don't have a lot of texts that are saying like this woman was reading this text and she donated to the church. We have to draw a lot of interesting lines of connection, but, um, Often what we find in our documentary papyri are that many women uh, who begin to have Christian names in the papyri are women of wealth and independent women of wealth. We also have a number of early Christian ascetics in Oxyrhynchus, female ascetics especially. So women who decide not to get married and often not to have children, um, but they're not necessarily living in monasteries. They're often living in their own little houses or apartments right in the middle of the city. So they're really involved in the city life, uh, but they've decided not to uh, have a traditional lifestyle. Um, this is also beneficial to the church, right? If they're not going to uh, bequeath their property to people who will inherit it, uh, all of that all of that funding and property is going to go to the church as well. So um, texts that really value asceticism and female patronage are really great for second and third century church officials who are really trying to grow their church. Wow, this is exciting. I, I just can't wait till more of your research comes out, Adeline. I want to know what happens. It's like a, a mystery story going on for us. So, um, I, I, excuse me, <clears throat> Anna, I want to... Um, ask you to ask one last question. We need to make it kind of brief so that we can end on time, but I'd love to hear what your next point is question or your question is. Go ahead. Whoops. I, I unintendedly um, muted you on So unmute yourself again, please. Okay. Um, yeah. Adeline mentioned finding themes in these scraps and then she held up her cell phone and said, they're about this size. And I'm fairly certain that on a scrap of papyrus that size, you aren't going to get the kind of print that we get on our cell phone screens. So with that small amount of information, how can you even identify a theme? Yeah, so um, what I mean by this is that the, the pages themselves are not this size, but the scraps that we have left are often that size. So... If I were to rip off a piece of paper, we might have a copy of the Gospel of Matthew that's this big, right? And we're able to identify it as a copy of the Gospel of Matthew because there are uh, a series of words and lines in Greek on this side and a series of words and lines in Greek on this side. Um, and by cross-referencing them with text that we know, we're able to identify it as that kind of text. But we don't have the whole copy of the Gospel of Matthew, right? We have dozens and dozens of other texts that we found from Oxyrhynchus with text on the front, text on the back that mention Jesus, um, but we have no idea what the text is, right? So we have lots of different sayings of Jesus that don't have overlap with our canonical gospels. So yeah, good question. So when you, when you mention a theme, it's because you've been able to connect it with something larger that includes those words. Right. So it might mention something about the resurrection. It might mention something about baptism. It might mention something about um, a specific term used to describe the father or uh, a divine light or some type of poetic language that we're able to just make out traces of. And then you find it in some other text also, I assume. Yeah. And sometimes we can piece them together, uh, but often we can't. Yeah. Right. And of course, that brings us to our discussion we had on the podcast on that little scrap from Oxyrhynchus on the Gospel of Mary, possibly. So mm -hmm. that's in case you all missed that, listen to the podcast with um, uh, Dr. Parkhouse on, on that little scrap from, from Oxyrhynchus, too. 
Well, as you can tell, Dr. Adeline Harrington, <laughs> we have so many wonderful questions to ask you. We'll be watching for you, and we wish you well with your dissertation defense coming up. Um, but also we'll be interested in seeing what comes of your work. It looks so interesting to the things that we're talking about here. Well, I have to say it's time to be moving along. This was the March 2024 textual study on the Bible and Bound Discussions titled New Discoveries in the Oxyrhynchus Trash Heap with guest scholar Adeline Harrington. Once a month from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern Time on Monday nights, usually the fourth of the month, we provide a discussion of one or more early Christian texts. Each month, one of our knowledgeable scholars leads these sessions, sharing a well-framed overview of these early Christian texts, allowing participants time to ask questions and share their insights. So let me tell you a little bit about what's coming up next month, which will be on the fourth Monday on April 22nd. We're actually going to turn the tables. I'm the one who's going to be interviewed and one of our regular guests Helen Mathis is going to interview me. So we're going to talk about how these long lost ancient texts can actually enhance our biblical understanding and deepen our faith. So I hope to see you then.